Boy, this song was a double barrel. It, it seemed like, you know, I love this record. It was a beautiful record, but it was sort of a miserable record about being, and a lot of people can relate to this, a, pe a person getting stuck in their routine so much that they just can't change. They, they just, they're so, they're so stuck in their comfort zone. In order to enrich your life, sometimes you got to step out of that comfort zone, take a few risks here and there, but, you know, it's, it's not, it's, it's easier said than done. Number 14, Spur with Bittersweet Symphony on my fantasy playlist, October 18th, 1997. I'll try to describe this as best I can. I want to talk about the song a little bit first, then the video. The song was sampled. The song sampled a tune by Andrew Odom. Andrew Odom, he was a manager of the Rolling Stones back in the early to mid-60s. He had written an orchestral arrangement a version of the Rolling Stones last time. The last time one of the Rolling Stones' biggest hits. I think it was their second top ten hit. Time was on my side. That was their first really, really big hit here in America. Then the last time in the spring of 1965. And then they went to mega stardom when Satisfaction went to number one back in the summer of 1965. But the last time was always my favorite song. But now, Andrew Oldham, the manager, had written an orchestral version of the last time. It was sampled in the first Bittersweet Symphony. I think that's why I've fell so much in love with that record because it, it probably subconsciously triggered memories of the last time by the Rolling Stones. But let me back up on this. They got slapped with a plagiarism charge. Alan Klein, he was a former manager of the Rolling Stones. He he owned a, he was an owner of a holding company called ABKCO Records. The original understanding was, now, now here's another thing, Alan Klein owned the copyrights to the Rolling Stones records pre-1970. That would definitely include the last time, which came out in 1965. The understanding was the group would get 50% of the royalties, that would be the verb. Alan Klein, or Andrew Odom, Rolling Stones would get 50% of the royalties. But then the song started to take off. They didn't realize how big the song was going to be. And when the song got really big, Alan Klein or one of his people, they called the group and said, Hey, you either give us 100% of the royalties or you just take the damn record off the shelf. Stop selling the record. Take it off. They had no choice. Alan Klein's a powerful guy. I've read about this guy. You, you just, ooh, man. He was also a manager of the Beatles, managed some of the Beatles' finances back in the early, back in the late 60s, early 70s, Got and that caused some dissension between Paul McCartney and some of the other group members like John Lennon and George Harrison who were in favor of Alan Klein. But that's another story. I don't want to get into that. But uh, anyway, that's how it worked. The firm was forced to surrender 100% royalties to Alan Klein and his holding company, ABKCO Records. The heavy rotation on MTV. MTV played the hell out of this video. I remember night after night after night and the fall of 1997 watching this video, enamored with this song so much, and Richard Ashcroft running, walking down the streets of London, and he's settled as the metaphor of routine. You get so stuck in your routine, you just ignore everything else that goes on around you. You just push through. You just push through the potential change and all that. And uh, I've always wondered, was like, uh, let me slow down. Bear with me. He'd bump into all these people. I remember. Remember the part. There was a guy who had this. He wore this huge trench coat. This trench coat. He held this enormous cell phone. <laughs> Remember that? I mean, it seems funny by today's standards, that big cell phone that he was holding. But uh, there was a couple of guys that he bumped into, Richard Ashcroft did, and it looked like they were going to try to pick a fight with him. But do you remember that part in the video where Richard Ashcroft, he's the lead singer of The Verb, he stopped. He almost got ran over by a car, and this girl just jumped out and just shouted at him, and he just, zombie-like, just went past her, just didn't care. And then he's joined by the group at the end of the video, and they walk off into, I guess, the sunset. Actually, uh, the video, see, I don't know if it was real or not. Were these people acting, or was it just, was it for real? Was this like reality TV? That, I never could figure that out. If you know about that, let me know, because I'm real curious about that. Curious about that. The video, though, 
Richard Ashcroft. It starts on the southeast corner of the intersection of Hoxton and Falcon Street. Falkert Street, rather. Falkert Street, that's in North London. And Richard Ashcroft, he proceeds north on the east side of, I think it's Hoxton Street, or it might be Falkert Street. I'll just say Hoxton Street. It's a cool video. I mean, and the song itself, the record, so powerful. In 1999, it got a nom it was nominated for Grammy Award for Best Rock Song. And a year before that, in 1998, BBC Radio One listeners they voted Bittersweet Symphony Symphony the best track ever. But I like the song that came after that. I think it was called Luck. Was it Lucky Man? I love that one too. That was in the spring of '98. Well, here's Bitter Bittersweet Symphony at number 14 on my fancy playlist. <laughs> 